Hello, BookTube. We're here for Chapter 10 of William Harris Arnold's Ventures in Book Collecting. It's the last chapter. It's Chapter 10, Letters of Notable Women. And he starts out with a quote from Montaigne. I have here only made a nosegay of culled flowers and have brought nothing of my own but the thread that ties them together. From the time when I began the delightful pursuit of book collecting almost 30 years ago, once in a while I bought a letter that bore some relation to a book or its author. After a few years, my interest in autographs increased to such an extent that I frequently ventured outside this limited field, so now there are hundreds of letters in my collection that have no particular association with any of my books and I have come to look upon the acquisition of autographs as, autographs as a pursuit with a fascination second to none. As there have always been many more distinguished men than distinct, distinguished women in this world, it is only natural that the larger portion of the letters I have collected were written by men, but no one need be told that these written by women are almost always the more entertaining. Unquestionably, this is due to certain charming qualities that exist only in the feminine mind. These qualities, variously expressed, may easily be discovered in the examples of the gentlest art here submitted. The common difficulty of providing a negative uh, renders it impractical always to be certain whether or not, or whether or no, a letter has ever been published. When I know a letter to have been printed hereafter, heretofore, I so state. Our first example was penned by the young Queen of England when she was twenty uh, in, in her 21st year. Uh, Windsor Castle, November 15th, 1839. My dear aunt, the constant affection and kindness, kindness which you have ever shown me makes me certain that you will take much interest in an event which so nearly concerns the future happiness of my life. I cannot therefore any longer delay to inform you of my attended marriage with my cousin Albert. The merits of this character are so well known to all who are acquainted with him, and I need say no more that I feel as assured of my own happiness as I can of anything here, be uh, here below and only hope I may be able to make him as happy as he deserves to be. As it is not yet to be publicly known, I must beg you not to mention it except to your own family. I hope you have quite recovered from uh, the serious accident you met uh, with when you were at Ramsgate. Believe me always, your very affectionate niece and cousin, Victoria R., Superscription, Her Royal Highness, the Prince, uh, Princess Sophia Matilda, the Queen. Uh, and there is signatures that he shows. Another letter written 12 years later tells us how well the royal romance turned out. Windsor Castle, February 10th, 1851. My dearest aunt, in both our names... Uh, accept my warmest thanks for your kind letter and wishes for this to me so very precious day. Each returning year increases my gratitude and happiness, and I feel that I can never uh, show all I owe to my beloved husband as I ought. He does so much for me, and I feel as if I did so little for him. What devotion, admiration, respect, and in incessant attachment can do ever will be his portion and ever will be awarded to him by me our father in heaven alone can know how deep and intense my feelings are we are glad to hear that the duchess of cambridge and mary were pleased with the children's performance mama uh, was much pleased with the duchess's visit on wednesday we came to london I regret to say it is a great change for me always. With Albert's love, ever, your devoted niece, V.G. About a year after this second letter of The Happy Queen was written, Prince Albert received a copy of the first edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly, with a letter from his author, from, from the author. 
Mrs. Stowe retained a copy of the letter, apparently the original draft. My copy. To His Royal Highness Prince Albert. The author of this work feels that she has no apology for presenting it to Prince Albert because it concerns the great interests of humanity and from those noble and large views of human progress, which she has at different times seen in his public speeches, she has inferred that he has an eye and heart for all that concerns the development and welfare of the human family. Ignorant of the forms of diplomatic address and the etiquette of rank, may she be pardoned for speaking with the republican simplicity of her own country as to one who poses a nobility, uh, po possesses a nobility higher than that of rank or station. This simple, simple narrative is an honest attempt to enlist the sympathies both of England and America in the sufferings of the oppressed race, to whom in less enlightened days both England and America are, were unjust. The wrong on England's part has been atoned uh, in a manner worthy of herself, nor in all her strength and glory is there anything that adds such luster to her name and the position she holds in relation to human freedom. May, Amer may America yet emulate her example. The appeal is in greater part as it should be. The writer's own country, but when f uh, fugitives by thousands are crowding British shores, uh, she will enlist for them the sympathy of British hearts. We in America have been told that the throne of Earth's mightiest nation is now filled by one less adorned uh, by all its world can give of power and splendor than by a good and noble heart, a heart ever ready to feel for the suffering and the oppressed and the lowly. The author is encouraged by the thought that beneath the royal insignia of England throbs that women's and mother's heart. May she ask that he who is nearest to her would present to her her notice uh, this simple story. Should it win from her compassionate nature, pity thoughts, pitying thoughts for those multitudes of poor outcasts who have fled from shelter to the shadow of her throne, it were enough. May the blessing of God rest on the noble country from which America draws her lineage and her the queen of it. Though all other thrones be shaken, may hers found deep in the hearts of her subjects be established to her and to her children through all generations. With deepest respect, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Brunswick, Maine, March 30th, 1852. Another letter gives a dramatic account of the anti-slavery compact uh, entered into agreement by Harriet and her brother Henry Ward Beecher. To Dr. Ross, Hartford, July twenty second, 1875. Dear Sir, I have read your work with unbated interest through to the end. It carries me back to the time when my brother Henry Ward Beecher and myself just returned from the Western life and come to live in the Eastern cities, were shocked and outraged by finding both in church and state a universal bowing down to the fugitive slave law. I remember his coming then to lecture up uh yeah, to lecture up in the state of Maine, where I was then giving or that I was then living, and of our meeting and sitting up at night to ask each other what we can do for a testimony against this great wrong. He was going to preach and lecture through the land, and I said I have begun a set of sketches in the national area era to illustrate the cruelty of slavery. I call it Uncle Tom's Cabin. That's right, he said. Write it, and we'll print it and scatter it, thick as leaves of Velbrosa. That was the beginning, and since then, what hath God wrought? Whether since when I have been tempted to be low spirited or desponding, I think well thank I, I well thank God for one thing I have lived to see slavery abolished, and God only knows uh, what a comfort uh, that is. Never let any one despair that has lived to see that. With a comfort to you must be the reflection that you have saved so many from these horrors. I congratulate you on such a record with sincere respect and sympathy. Ever truly yours, H.B. Stowe. In English history, the Victorians 
uh, the Victorian years will always be famous for their literary accomplishment. The number of writers of distinction, distinction that belong to the period is rivaled only by the Elizabethan. The year 1819, in which uh, Victoria was born, also gave birth to Marion Evans, who was George Eliot, was recognized in her day and is still recognized as the greatest of English women writers of all time. Her letter here presented was written to Monsieur d'Albert Durad, at uh, whose home in Geneva Miss Evans uh, resided en passe pension during the autumn and winter of 1849 to 1850. Holly Lodge, Southfields, Wandsworth, Surrey, October 18th, 1859. My dear friend, does it ever happen to, uh, to you now to think of the certain Englishman named Mary Evans? She seems perhaps to deserve that you should forget her, seeing that she has let years pass without making any sign of her existence. But in reality, she is not so blameworthy. When more than two years ago I wrote you a uh, word that I and my husband were going to the coast, I could not give you your permanent address, uh, not knowing uh, what I, what it would be, and it did not occur to me to mention any other address which would serve for all the times and seasons. Having made this omission, I could not bear from, uh, I could not hear from you again. And I had not the courage to write again myself, not feeling that I had anything to tell you that would be worth sending over uh, the Jura. But in these th uh, last three years, a great change has come over my life, a change in which I cannot help believing that both you and Madame d'Albert will rejoice. Under the influence of the intense happiness I have enjoyed in my married life, from through moral and intellectual sympathy, I have at last found out my true vocation, after which my nature had always been feeling and striving uneasily without finding it. What do you think that vocation is? I pause for you to guess. I have turned out to be an artist, not as you are with the pencil and the palette, but with words. I have written a novel which people say has stirred them very deeply, and not a few people, but almost all reading England. It was published in February last, and already 14,000 copies have been sold. The title is Adam Bede, and George Eliot, the name on the title page, is my nom de plume. I had previously written another work of fiction called Scenes of Clerical Life, which had a great literary success, but not a great popular success such as Adam Bede has had. Both are now published by Toshins, um in the series of English novels. I think you will believe that I uh, do not write you word of... I think you will believe that I did, do not write you word of this out of any small vanity. Any books are deeply serious things to me and come out of all the painful discipline, all the most hardly learnt lessons of my past life. I write you word of it because I believe that both your kind heart and Madame d'Albert's too will be touched with real joy that one whom you may, whom you know, uh, when she was not very happy and when her life seemed to serve no purpose of much worth has been at last blessed with the sense that she has done something worth living and suffering for. And I write also because I want to give both you and her a proof uh, that I still think of you with grateful affection and recollection. My books are s such close and detailed pictures of English life that I hardly know whether they will affect foreign readers uh, strongly. Yet I cannot help wishing that Madame d'Albert could read them, for I think the views of, of life with, such, with which they are written would excite her sympathy. I am very much changed from the many of old age, old days. The years have altered me so much inwardly as outwardly. In some things, however, I am just the same, and some of my failings I fear, but it is not a failing to retain a vivid remembrance of past scenes and to feed warm and to feel warm uh, towards friends whose kindness lies far back in the distance. And in these things, I am the same as when I used to walk on La Freebie with you and Madame d'Albert. Do I deserve, do I des 
deserve that you should write me some word about yourselves. Everything you could tell on that subject would be interesting. Adolfo and Charles, Charles are now bearded men. Are they not? I remember them with the more interest because Mr. Lewis, uh, was three, uh, has three boys, the youngest of whom is about the age of your Charles and reached, had reached when I was in Geneva. Our boys are all three at Hoffel under Dr. Miller, who has revived F. Monberg's Institute there. They went soon after I wrote to you on the subject of the foreign school, the Hoffel school appearing to suit Mr. Lou's views better than that of the uh, Genovese uh, gentleman whom you kindly mentioned to me. I almost fear to send my letter after the long lapse of time in which I have known nothing of you with and uh, what had what sad things may have happened yet I will hope that such fear is groundless and that you and Madame de Albert are leading the same peaceful pleasant life as ever and excellent friends around you. How I should love to see Geneva again, but that too is greatly changed, is it not? We were in Switzerland in the summer, but had no, not time to go uh, so far as Geneva. Another time when we go into Italy, I hope to revisit my dear old scene and show it to my husband. Farewell, dear friend. Ask Madame d'Albert to accept my affectionate regards and believe me faithfully yours, Marion E. Luz. The little book of rhymes mentioned in the next letter is, of course, the united production of the Bronte sisters published under the suggestively masculine pseudonyms of Courier Ellis and Acton Bell. The reader will scarcely need to be reminded that the initial letters of these names were those of Charlotte, Emily, and Anne. The sale of the volume then issued was the negligible. Today it is one of the rarissima of 19th century poetry. Mrs. Gaskell had first met Charlotte Bronte in the summer of 1850, only a few weeks before the letter was written. The acquaintance quickly uh, ripened to intimacy, and her amiable life of her friend Mrs. Gaskell quotes only the third paragraph of the letter. It seems worthwhile to print all of it here. Haworth, September 26, 1850. My dear Mrs. Gaskell, on, on no account must you give yourself the trouble of sending uh, the prelude to Smith and Elder, nor indeed need you return it to me at present. Keep it in, a, uh, it in pledge till I come and redeem it. Though when that will be, I cannot say. My father is not well, yet better uh, than he has been. He has taken scarcely any duty for some weeks past i should not like to have him now leave him now uh, i told mrs smith mr smith that i had sent you the prelude and his answer was that he should be very happy if any of the books he lends me could be made available for your entertainment also i expect another uh, ha uh, batch by and by when they come, I will tell you their titles, and you shall make a choice. The little book of rhymes was sent by way of fulfilling a rashly made promise, and the promise was made to prevent you from throwing away four shillings in an injudicious purchase. I do not like my own share of the work, nor care that I should be read. Ellis Bell's poems, I think, good and vigorous, and Actons have the merit of truth and simplicity. Mine are chiefly juvenile productions, the results of effervescence of mind that would not be still. In those days, the sea will often rot and was, was uh, the sea too often rot and was tempestuous, and weed, sand, shingle all turned up in the tumult. This image is much too malign malinquent uh, for the subject but you will pardon it i wonder what it is, what it was i said that say, suited you in vain have i puzzled my memory to make out what it should be you were well you were well neither in my mind or body when you wrote last i trust you are better now rumor says you are expected from your 
that we are to expect from you a Christmas book, but rumor so often airs. I scarce dare trust your her assertions, especially when they are pleasant. Thank you for your flowers. When put in water, they revived and looked quite fresh and very beautiful. I keep them for more than a week. The bit of heliotrope I especially prized for its incomparable perfume. For the present, goodbye, my dear Mrs. Gaskell. When you have time, write one line to say how you are. If the report about the Christmas book is not true, make it true. I am hungry for the genuine bit of refreshment, but you must mind not to pierce one with too keen-edged emotion. There are parts of Mary Barton I shall never dare to read a second time. It is that unconscionable, Mr. Uh, Chapman satisfied yet not that Mary Barton has reached a fourth edition. Believe me, yours sincerely, C. Bronte, Mrs. Gaskell, uh, Plymouth Grove. Our next letter was written by Mrs. Gaskell to Miss Geraldine Edzer Dewsbury, a woman of unusual literary attainment and author of several works of fiction. I believe the reader will agree with me that Mrs. Gaskell's sprightly gossip is worthy of recognition here. P. Grove, July 21st, Monday, 1854. My dear Geraldine, I beg to say you never put your address on the letter you wrote to me well. I got it from Mrs. Carlyle, uh, forgot it, and it was only from Mrs. Gaskell's letter I picked it up again or you'd have heard from me long before this. Yes, it was very good of you to jog the uh, Athenians' uh, memory about me and very naughty of them to take no notice of being jogged, which they haven't. Oh, how pretty and fresh and charming your a account of your lovely old-fashioned rectory was. If your novel is not good, uh, you've no excuse. Yes, I have been up to London, I went and try and shake off my half bargain for so I understood it with Dickens to uh, to succeed him in H words uh, with a story as long as as Ruth. He would not let he would not let me off indeed when I found out uh, how he had understood it all. It is all a full bargain. I durst not uh, for my honor's sake, propose giving it up, though I am in a rage with myself in my unbusiness-like ways in having in, uh, concluded an arrangement by talking and not upon paper, in which latter case there can be no mistake. To take me for the war take so take me for a warning, my dear, instead of an example. My story could be good if anybody uh, could read it. As a whole, read in driblets, it will seem dull and be dull, for I have not the art and would not, if I could, to write for weekly effects. However, they should. Well, however, why should I bore you with all this when perhaps you are in the pangs, in the pangs yourself? Who knows? The only thing was that my three weeks in London, <coughs> and then. Um, square brackets, uh, name undecipherable, Bedford Row was spoilt by it. First I had to write up a certain point, which I had not done before I went. Then I had to wait a Dickens decision, frame and fr fume and fret at my own stupidity and into passion when he sent me word the story would do for him. I had trusted it would not. So I paid no calls whatever, save two. One to Mrs. Carlyle, other to Miss Charlie. I let no one know I was in London, but of course, by and by, last four days, invitations came in, some very nice, but of course, these last were of the days beyond the time to which I could stay, and so I came back like a misanthrope fuming in my at my species. That was five weeks before, uh, since I have written away like uh, a tiger. Do tigers ever write? They're the most energetic animal animal I could think of, with the dinner so, uh, with dinner just coming on the table. Seen nobody, had no letters, uh, scolded right and left, and been uh, as disagreeable as possible. Well, 
I wonder if you care for uh, my small London experiences. I want to see La jo Joie Fille pair at the French Theatre. Exquisite. Oh, most exquisite. That's just all I can say. And I rushed in and out of the Academy exhibition and glimpsed at all the pictures necessary to be talked about and was not deeply impressed by any. And I went to the French Ditto and Pall Mall. Do go if it's open when you're in London. And I went to a quiet, and then in brackets again, a word undecipherable, uh, at the Carlyle's house, i.e. called quiet, but not half so pleasant as if it had been brookfields james marshall's mrs newberg and miss miss keir grant whoever she may be upstairs in the new room which looked very pretty and to a great do at and again name undecipherable um where where all the world and his wife charles carlisle thackeray and his eldest daughter uh, Mackenzie Doyle, Kingsley, Maurice, Sir Alex, uh, Gordon, Proctors, Longmans, Tom Taylor, etc., 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 and quantity of smart titles. It grew pleasant towards the end of the evening when the rooms cleared and one could see and get to people. Those were all the gaieties in London. Mrs. Bronte is married, and I ought to write to her, but I've a panic about the husband seeing my ladder letters. Bridegrooms are always curious. Husbands are not. Meta comes home from London today. Manchester is very empty. Nothing, nobody stirring. Yours very affectionately, E. Gaskell. If I were offered as a prize, if I were offered as a prize the choice of a single letter of any one of the many distinguished women of the past two centuries under the stipulation that the contents of the letter should remain undisclosed until the choice was made, I would say, give me one by Jane Welsh Carlyle. I have never read one of her hers and was not a delight. I don't believe she could have written a dull one, and her best are among the most charming of women's letters. Of the three letters here printed, the first two were written to Carlyle uh, in April 1841 while he was visiting young Richard Mockton Milnes, afterward Lord Houghton, uh, most highly regarded as the first biography of John Keats. The third letter was addressed to Mrs. Gilchrist, a London neighbour. Friday. Virtue it's a virtue its own reward never sir had you been neglectful and sent me no letter yesterday some scribblement better or worse would have proceeded from me yesterday but the receiving of your letter ass assuaged those wants of my heart to speak in the language of the minerva press which would uh which would else have sought assuagement in writing to you and besides the letter on glazed paper written with the best of pens, beautiful outwardly and inwardly, gave me such an idea, ideal of what you would expect of when you were entitled uh, to in return. And I had no longer assurances enough to put you off and one of my rough and ready scrolls, scrawls, scrawls, sorry, uh, which as goodness of chaos presiding over the rambling and tumbling of a first-rate earthquake, and with all considerable uh, of a headache at the same time, was the best I could have done for you. Today I thought I should be able to write copper plate, to spell, and to put my words together, if not with a certain grace, at, at lowest with a certain intelligibility, and you see, but it's of no use rebelling against providence, and so I will carry on and keep ever, never minding. No letters have come except your own, and your own having come, no others are missed. Thank heavens it is no worse with you. So far as I can read your horoscope at this distance, it seems to me pretty fairish. I have great faith in your young host. In fact, I believe we might have uh, riddled creation uh, without finding a man better fitted to take charge of you under difficult circumstances. Uh, if he brings you back a uh, gladder and a foolisher man, I, sh I shall be under external, eternal uh, obligations to him, so, uh, so say so with my kind regards. 
Darwin came yesterday, fully confident of finding Carlisle still here. He stood, he stayed, but a short while, having to call for Mister Old, for Old uh, Mrs. Pepeloy, told me nothing, uh, being in a, in fact in the muddiest condition of ditch water. Uh, Rossini came full of solicitude about the dangerous state of Lord Granville. It would be such a pity if he died before having received Mr. Carlyle's letter. Every man for himself and the devil for all. I sent him in quest of the weekly dispatch, which he speedily realized for me, but the criticism is not half so scurrilous as one would have wished, as one would have wished. And so, as it would hardly make you laugh, it is hardly worth sending. I send it, however, since I have got to, but under cover not to uh, compromise your character by addressing such a paper to you in a Tory house. Nobody else has been here. My evenings are as quiet as if I were uh, at the back of beyond, only Helen now, and then making noises as if ghost of Hamlet. I have employed the quietness rather un unprofitably, uh, you will think, in reading Maturin's Melmoth and the Wanderer in four, four volumes. A strange book which I never heard tell of and wonder that I never did, for I find it as much wild energy and poetic beauty of the distracted sort as in any dozen of the uh, geniuses that we see going about the street. The man seems to want only someone, uh, some one thing, common sense perhaps, to have been great in this day and generation, or perhaps his defect was simply having been born an Irishman and with a consequent leaning towards lying and stealing. Here are newspapers and a letter from my mother, chiefly about you, so I send it. Take very care of yourself and do not think. Above all, write and love me. Yours ever, Jane C. Second letter. Uh, dearest, John is writing to you upstairs. You must certainly have got two letters from me by this time, and so I merely take up this bad pen to let you know I am in, I am in being and heartily glad to hear good accounts of your mother, if not the best of your poor self. A letter from my mother had told me before John came that she was uh, much better. God bless me if you walked into Templand without a note of preparation. How dreadful would be the result. For my mother evidently uh, writing in the idea of your being here and the sudden apparition, apparition of you there uh, would surely throw her into fits. My dear God, I do not like to say uh, make haste to come back, for I am, uh, I can get along tolerably without you for a time, and you hate this poor place as much, but still I fancy that this knocking about in Annandale is not the sort of thing to make you a stranger, and uh, that after all that you would uh, mend just as fast in London, bad as it is beside me. Do not, however, come a moment sooner on my account. I am not solitary, am not idle, ergo not melancholy. It is amazing the quantity of housework that turns up for me to do. One would say that the dirt here has come to me like the spot of blood on the key of Bluebeard's closet. As fast you rub it with one side, it reappears on the other. But you still find us clean uh, when you come back by the way of Helen made a not unjudicious mark in the effect uh, liking to be produced on you by your sojourn among the aristocracy. I told her that she had scribbled something very well. What does it matter, uh, she, said she, when the master comes uh, home, oot, o oh, thy grain houses, he'll never see the difference between or clean and dirty. Fraser sent a note for yesterday along with your letter to him and Emerson's uh, to you there was also a book entitled The Rights of Laymen, Five Pence, Three Farthing, Too Dear. I am afraid at sixpence I had to pay for it. Also a letter from New York Postage, eight pence. <coughs> um, 
uh, two farthings, uh, requesting to be favored with your autograph. How sick I am getting of those Yan these Yankees. But here comes John looking as restless as need be, so no more bash, blash at present. Your affectionate Jane Carlyle. And the third letter. My dear Mrs. Gilchrist, and it's Aberdour Fife. Uh, I don't remember when I engaged to write to you or not, uh, but anyhow, the spirit moves one to write and exactly at the wrong moment. When I have the softest pen and the thickest ink and has uh, that has fallen in my way since I left home, I suppose you are long rem removed to your country quarters and have derived, I hope, more benefit from the change than I have done as yet. I suppose the dreadful fatiguing journey uh, racked me up uh, to such an extent that it has taken all its time of pure air, quiet, and new milk and rum to overcome the bad consequences. Certainly, between ourselves, I am not sensibly of having gained an atom of strength, either bodily or mentally, since I left Chelsea. And yet, with a difference between the dead wall, one looks out at the Shane Row and the view from our window here, unsurpassed, I am sure, by the Bay of Naples, or any other view of earth, and between the exultations uh, from the Thames, complicated with the vitriol factory and Chancellor Dunghill, and those airs from the Atlantic blowing on our hilltop. One ought to be well here, and now that one has a, a cuddy, uh, donkey, all to oneself, as the children say, to walk about on the four legs of one's two own legs being no go, one ought to admit one has everything needed for happiness except indeed one thing, the faculty of being happy. Mr. C. is much pleased with the place and uh, the soft food it yields for himself and horse. And as he hardly works at all, he would be much better if he ha <coughs> excuse me, as if he didn't, as he always does in the country, take health by the throat, as it were, bathing as if he were a little boy in the serpentine, walking as if he had seven league boots, and riding like the wild huntsman, the consequence of all which is that he keeps up uh, in him the continual fever of biliousness. Uh, Charlotte uh, is the happiest of created girls, everything so new to her, everything delightful except the open admiration of Abadur lads who call her Bonnie Wee Lassie uh, in the public high highway, so kind to them, she says, when they never saw her before and don't so much as know her name. Mr. C. remarked justly that the compliments to himself were the only words of Scotch he could manage to understand, and those and these he understood at once uh, by instinct. Nero is a much-improved dog. By sea bathing with his master, he snores less, scratches less, and is less selfish. And the horse? Oh, Mr. C. declares... It is in perfect raptures over its soft food, but incapable of recovering from the astonishment at the bald, bald, badness of the Fife Rose. So we shall do very well at the farmhouse for as long as we have it till the 6th of August. After that, our plans are still in the vague. Goodbye, dear woman. Goodbye, dear woman. I do hope Mr. Gilchrist will find some work in the winter to keep you still uh, our neighbors, yours most truly, Jane Carlyle. <coughs> uh, this is a letter in my collection written by Walter Scott to his Irish friend Matthew Weld Hartsong, uh, who had provided Scott with material for his Life of Swift, when just uh, then just published. The date of the letter is July 18, 1814. By a happy coincidence, his letter came into my hands in the very same day in the summer of 1922 that I uh, also secured the uh, celebrated Ot Scotus Ot Diabolus letter of Maria Edgeworth, which she addressed to the author of Waverley. It came of the publisher James Ballantry, and we all know uh, Waverley was issued anonymously. I quote here from the Scots letter. 
I have picked a square deal box as well as uh, as well and neatly as I could with the various treasures I received from you for for instance in Swift finding my box too large I have picked up in the top two or three new publications for your acceptance the first is Waverly a novel in three volumes of which the good town of Edinburgh uh, gave me credit as the author they do do me they do me too much honor and I hardly wish I had both the credit and profit but I believe you will make it uh, through uh, make it though perhaps not as much as I do uh, who am sensible of the likeness of the old-fashioned portraits the author must have had your imitable mrs Edge, edgeworth strongly in its view for the manner uh, is probably imitated with the pictures are original mrs edgeworth's letter was published in several irish and english newspapers in the year 1842 i do not know whether it was subsequently appeared in print the enthusiastic appreciation of waverley by by the edgeworth family uh, so vividly described by the talented daughter is typical of the reception that was given the novel by the British reading public. Edgeworth's Town, October 23rd, 1814. Out Scotus, out Diablus. We have this moment finished Waverley. It was read aloud to this large family, and I wish the author could have witnessed the impression it made, the strong hold it seized. Uh, of the feelings both of young and old, the admiration raised by beautiful descriptions of nat nature, by the new and bold delineations of character, the perfect manner in which every character is sustained in every change of a situation from first to last without effort, without the affection of making uh, the people speak in character, the ingenuity with which each person introduced in the drama is made useful and necessary to the end, the admiral art with which the story is constructed, and with which, which with which the author keeps his own secrets till the precise moment when they should be revealed, whilst in the meantime, with the skill of Shakespeare, the mind is prepared by unseen degrees for all the changes of feeling and fortune, so that nothing however extraordinary shocks us as improbable and the interest is kept up to the last moment we are so pleased with the relief belief that the whole story and every character in it was real and we could not endure the occasional addresses from the author to the reader they are like fielding but for that reason we cannot bear them we cannot bear that an author of such high powers of such original genius <coughs> We could not bear that an author of such high powers and of such original genius should for the moment stoop to imitation. This is the only thing we dislike. There are the only passages we would omit in the whole work and let the unqualified manner in which I say this and very vehemence to my expression of this disappropriation be a sure pledge to the author of the sincerity of all the admiration i feel for his genius i have not yet said half uh we felt in reading the work the characters are not only finely drawn as separate figures but they are grouped with great skill and contrasted so artfully and yet so naturally as to produce the happiest dramatic effect and at the same time to relieve the feelings and attention in the most agreeable manner the novelty of the high land, highland world which is discovered at your view excited curiosity and interest powerful but uh, though it is all new to us it does not embarrass or perplex or strain the attention we never are harassed by doubts of the probability of such of these modes of life though we do not know them uh <clears throat> we are certain quite certain that they did exist exactly as they are representative we are sensible and there is a peculiar merit in the work which is the great measure lost upon us the di dialects of the highlanders and the lowlanders etc but there is another and a higher merit with which we are as much struck and as much delighted as any true born scotsman could be the various graduations graduations of scottish feudal character from the high-born chieftain to the military baron to the noble-minded lieutenant uh even duel the robber 
uh, Bean Lin and the savage Callum Beg, the pre, the cavalier is beautifully drawn. A prince, I, every inch a prince. He polished manner, his polished manners, his exquisite address, politeness, and generosity interest the reader in, irresistibly and pleases the more from the contrast between him and those who surround him. I think he is my favorite character. The Baron uh, Brad Wardine is my father's. He thinks it required more genius to invent a more ability, uniformity to sustain his character than any of the varied variety of masterly characters with which the work abounds. There is indeed uncommon art in the manner in which his dignity is preserved by his courage uh, a magnanimity in spite of all the all of his pedantry and his ridiculous and his and his bear and his boot jack and all the uh, raillery of Mac Mac Ivor. Mac Ivor's unexpected uh, bear and bookjack made me la made us laugh heartily, but to return to the dear uh, good Baron, though I acknowledge that I am not as good a judge as my father and brothers are of this uh, recondite learning and his law Latin, yet I feel the humor and was touched by the quick, uh, by strokes of generosity, gentleness, and pathos in this old man, who, by the way, is all in good time worked up into a very dignified father-in-law for the hero. His exclamation of, oh, my son, my son, and the yielding of the uh, fortuitous character of the Baron uh, to the natural feelings of the father. Even uh, Duel's fear and his father-in-law should die quietly in his bed made us laugh almost as much as the bear and the bookjack. Jinker in the battle, pleading the case, uh, the cause of the mare which he had sold to Bomwapel, uh, which had thrown him for want of a proper bit of truly comic. My father says that this has some other passages respecting horsemanship could not have been written by anyone who has not mastered both of the great and the little horse. Uh, I, I tell you without order the great and little strokes of humor or pathos just as I recollect or am reminded um, of them in the moment uh, by my companions. The fact is that we have had the volumes only during the time we could read them and as fast as we could read lent to us as a great favor by one who was happy enough to have secured a copy before the first and second editions were sold in London, London, Dublin. When we applied uh, not a copy could be had. We expected one in the course of the next week, but we resolved to write to the author without waiting for a second perusal. Judging by our own feelings, the authors, uh, we guess that he would rather know our genius, our genuine first thoughts, than wait for cool second thoughts or have a regular eulogium or criticism put into the most l lucid order and given in the finest sentences that ever were rounded. It is possible that I have got thus far without having uh, named Flora or Vich Ian Vor, and last Vich Ian Vor, yet our minds are full of them uh, the moment before I began the letter, and could you have seen the tears forced from us by their faith, their fate and would have been satisfied with the pathos uh, went to our hearts. Ivan Vore, from the first moment he appears to the last, is an admirable drawn and finely sustained character, new, perfectly new to the English reader, often entertaining, always heroic, and sometimes sublime. Sublime, the grey spirit, the bodic class thrills us with horror. Fil us that affect must it have been. What if? Uh, what effect that must have been under the influence of the superstitions of the Highlands. This circumstance is admirably introduced. The superstition is a weakness quite consistent with the strength of the character, perfectly natural under the disappointment of all his hopes in the depiction 
in the dejection of his mind and the exhaustion of his bodily strength. Flora, we could wish, was never called Miss Mac Ivor because in the country there are tribes of vulgar Miss Macs and the association is unfavorable to the sublime and beautiful uh, of your Flora. She is a true heron. Her first <coughs> appearance seized upon the mind and enchanted us so completely that we are certain that she was to be your heroine and the wife of your hero, but with that imminable art and gradually uh, convinced your art, uh, the imitable art, you gradually convince the reader that she was not, and she said of herself, capable of making Waverley happy. Leaving her in full possession of our admiration, you just made us pity, then love, and at last give our undivided affection to Rose uh, Bradwardine sweet scotch rose the last scene between flora and waverley is highly pathetic my brother wished that bridal garment were shroud he thinks it would be stronger and more natural because when the heart is touched we seldom use metaphor or quaint alliteration bride fe favor bride garment there is one thing more we could wish changed or omit in flora's character i have not the volume and therefore cannot referred to the page, but I recollect in the first visit to Flora when she is to sing certain verses, there is a walk in which the description of the place is beautiful but too long, and we did not like the preparation for a scene and the appearance of Flora and her harp. It was too like common heroine. She would be far alone, all stage effect or uh, novelist trick. These are, without reserve, the only faults we find or can find in this work of genius. We should scarcely have thought them worth mentioning, except to give you proof positive that we are not flatterers. Believe me, I have not, nor can I convey to you the full idea of the pleasure to the light we have had in reading, uh, reading Waverley, nor of the reading of sorrow with which we came at the end of the history of persons whose real presence had so filled our minds. We felt that we must return to the uh, flat real realities of life and that our stimulus has gone. We were little deposed to read the postscript, which should have been a preface. Well, let us hear it, said my father and Mrs. E. Read on. On my dear sir, oh, my dear sir, um, how much pleasure would my father and my mother and my whole family as well as myself have lost if we had not read the last page and the pleasure came upon us so unexpectedly we had been so completely absorbed and every thought of ourselves or our own authorship was far far away thank you for the honor to you have done us and for your pleasure you have given us great in proportion in to the opinion and to the formed uh, of the work that we had just perused and believe me every opinion i have in this letter expressed was formed before any individual in the family had peeped to the book to the end of the book or knew how much we owed you your obliged and grateful maria edgeworth to the author of waverley it has been a matter of some concern to me how to introduce the writer of the next letter, for although when she came to Paris after her marriage she was received by Queen Mary Antoinette, uh, we may be quite sure that none of the other women whose letters appear in this chapter would have count, uh, countersended a uh, person of her character. I decide, I decide not to introduce her, but... Uh, take for granted that you are all acquainted with the fascinating Emma, Lady Hamilton, and the story of her notorious career. The letter covers four folio pages, measuring twelve by nine and one quarter inches. It is without date or place and begins abruptly uh, without greeting, as not a few 18th century letters do. I hope you recovered from your late indisposition. I hope if you have the gout in your hands it will fall into your feet and when it is in your feet uh, you must stay at home and then you write to your friends for it is an age since i have heard from yourself indeed i hear frequently from the others for i don't know any man that has 
so many friends as Fish Crawford, though they all say he is an old fish, an odd fish, but a good one. I say a man past 45 or 50 when 20 years worth of gout about him may be allowed to be odd. True, says you, the Malmesbury's went to Rome last Monday. I beg you will joke him about the Duchess of de Fleury, a pretty French girl of 23. He was fo foolishly in love with uh, for her, I say foolishly, because she made a, few, a fool on him. He was after her for morning, from morning till night, and in the same time she was dying for Lord Dacoth. Childish work, the Prince Augustus has been very ill, but is now well again. Last night we went to Pordici, where he lives, and I sang to him as he was very fond of music, and as fond as the Prince of Wales. He is very like him in his person, and Prince of Wales is a much handsomer man, but you will like Prince A. Uh, he is the most amiable, best man I know, thou not, though not so clever as the people of Wales, in, indeed, or the Prince of Wales, sorry, uh, ended, uh, in, ended, uh, there are few men as accomplished as the Prince of Wales. I really admire him. So does all who had the honor of knowing him and asked the prince if he knows Mr. Bowen. She is a fine, uh, Mrs. Bowen. She is a fine uh, city lady and has come abroad for the improvement of her education. I wish it was so. Every word she says, the Prince of Wales told me to the, uh, so to the prince laughed and said, Mrs. B., you have the most wicked eyes in the world. Really, Mrs. B., you are the very like lady, lad, uh, in short. She is the greatest fool in the world, I am sure. Of uh, The Prince of Wales spoke to her. It is, is only to laugh at her and many... Uh, to laugh at her, uh, many see that she has not uh, been used. So good company she dined with the other day, and I invited Lord and Lady Plymouth as she had been recommended to the latter. It was my Lady Countess uh, every moment. In short, poor Lady uh, P and my and self was uh, so tired of her titles that Mrs. B, that we now dread the sight of her, don't let this letter be uh, thrown about your room as you do all your others. Are uh, you you got it into your new house yet? Where are the Devonshires? How how goes old Q? Do you see Mister Knight of uh, Mrs. Knight of Granville? Uh, send me some news. We have Mister Erdley, son of Lord Erdley. He is now lying in the malaria. Uh, <clears throat> malaria. Uh, fine young man, I believe. An only son. Do you know Lord Shrewsbury? He is at Naples with a small brig he brought of uh he, he bought of uh Lord Uxbridge. Lord S is the oldest man in the world. He is what what you would call a Tory. He looks like a shrew a shrewmaker be lorded, very mean looking, wears a flaxen wig, not large enough to cover his own black hair. He never says a word except when he speaks to him, and when it, and then in his eyes or no, the only thing he likes in eating, as I have been told in London, uh, he has brought his kitchen uh, next uh, his dining room, and he is he may have his beef steaks hot from the grid iron, hot for any other person. Poor man, he is not capable of feeling. He looks at a pretty woman with the. As a little difference, or perhaps less than, uh, he would look at his wig. How does Lord Stair go on his properly called? Uh, for I am sure he used to, to stare me out of cont uh, contendence to you remember. Do you remember Satter's Wells? One bad effect being uh, thought a mistress. Fellows think they are at liberty to insult them when the very name of wife carries respect with it.
what a happy woman I am, thanks to my dear Sir William. I am not I am out of the reach of all those insults I hear your friend Mr Blair is going is got a living. I have wrote to him to desire he will now get a wife, for it is more decent for a clergyman to make use of his own than his neighbor's goods. Lord McCartney wrote to me lately he recommended a very amiable man to as uh, Sir George Stanton. He only came for six days. He said of yesterday from Naples with two Chinese are now accompanying them on their extended embassy to China. I am proud of my correspondent, Lord M. I shall write to him next post to thank him for the uh, recommendata uh, that I now take the opportunity of thanking you for having made me acquainted with the amiable character as Lord M. Uh, indeed, I I owe you many such obligations. I have, I hope you often see dear Dutons. He is a true friend and a perfect, good, amiable character, and I would go any lengths to serve a friend. I never shall forget the pains uh, he took for me and the friendly, anxious part he acted throughout the whole of his difficult affairs. Pray give me love to him. Have you heard from your brother or your sister? Are they at Paris still? Have you got any pictures home yet? Do you ever a, a intend to come uh, and see the original? Uh, don't come with old Q. I won't have him as he is false whilst I, I entertain his company. It was all well, but I have it from very good authority the moment my back was turned he abused me a nasty old uh, son of a sin uh, show him uh, this if you please and tell the avaricious beast of human nature he is beneath the contempt of such a poor low-born girl as emma or else she would be have expostulated with him on his uh, ill illiberty uh, adio love crawford Believe me, you're uh, obliged and sincere, Emma Hamilton. The Mrs. Montague referred uh, to in the letter uh, that now invites your attention was Elizabeth Robinson Montague, the celebrated leader of the Blue Stockings. This talented woman, believing that exchange of ideas was better than shuffle of cars, invited her friends to a series of convention parties with the suggestion that decision be confirmed confined to literary and artistic topics the blue stockings were soon the talk of the town the origin of the term as applied to the intellectual woman has been vigorously attributed it is now uh, placed with benjamin stillingfleet a naturalist and well-known dilettante uh, dilettante of the period mrs montague had requested her guests to adopt simple forms of dress. So Benjamin, putting aside his customary black silk hose, came to the parties in blue stockings of wool. This informality wittily, see, wit, wittily seized provided the everlasting epithet, epithet. The writer of the letter was Fanny Burney, Dr. Johnson's little Burney, later Madame Dobley. She she will always be remembered for her, for her celebrity diary and her entertaining novels, Evelina, uh, Cecilia, Camilla, and The Wanderer. This letter is without greeting. It is. It was addressed to Mrs. Thrall. The Blue Stockings assemblies were begun in the late 1770s and were continued to the end of the century. Uh, dated fr uh, Friday, May 31st. How precisely have you forestalled my answer to your inquiry of what says Mrs. Montague to the influenza? We had a very small party at the Blue Palace. No ladies but Mrs. and Mrs. Ord, and no gentlemen but Mr. Langdon and Mr. Scott and, and Lord uh, Monbato, who would talk to me of nothing but Homer, uh, to, to the no little diversion of Miss Ord and Mrs. Gregory, uh, to the no small muscle suffering of myself. I fancy he mistook me for Mrs. Straitfield, for Mr. Seward, uh, ever studious of mischief and ridicule, gave a long and florid account both of her and of me to him at our house, and probably he has so confounded us together that should he next meet her, he would ask that uh, what said her about writing Evelina. 
uh, the master was not there. So we saw not the house further than the bedroom. And the fine bed uh, was an admirable object for Lord Mont uh, Monbato, who talked to me about the bed, sofa, chairs, nectar, and ambrosia of Juno and Jupiter, as mentioned uh, by our friend Homer, till to the grave exceeded all power of face. And, however, by his old lord's mistake, Miss Stritfield might lose her credit for her ivory neck, uh, nose and notions a la Greek. I am at least sure she lost not through me her title to the epithet of Smiling Sophie. Uh, she called upon me just now, as I am much mistaken, if she is gently in enchanted at this new connection of her brothers. She too has had the influenza and did not look well pretty. Uh, pretty she could not help looking, I thought, of, of your making Mrs. Montague stare at the bath at Bath with the threatening of her with songs to uh, uh, filthy tunes when the other uh, evening in taking Mrs. Sh uh, Chapone home from Mrs. Peeps, uh, Mr. Peeps, uh, we were three times in danger of being overturned in the midst of Tuesday night storm from the pavement being broken up in the streets leading to the house. I quite longed to quote upon her, you upon her, but did not dare. Uh, the next letter, dated Wednesday, the June 5th, I wrote thus much, uh, thus much, dearest madam, to send by an opportunity which I missed. Your last note I have just received and will certainly wait upon you tomorrow. I am by no means surprised that all your house should be sick for the universal is sickness. You could not have been made of penetrable stuff uh, to have escaped it. I will tell you about us and our torments tomorrow. SS wanted me to go uh, with her to the Stretham today, but she gave me no warning, and I can at present arrange nothing in the, in a hurry. I am quite rejoiced in the thought of so soon seeing you again, through only for a moment, uh, though only for a moment, uh, forever I am truly dearest Mrs. Thralls, F.B., I have been again at Mrs. Montague's, but did not again meet her <coughs> dear Homer friends. <coughs> the star of the evening was Lord Bristol, who shone indeed with much resplendency. Lord Westcott tried to twinkle with him, but did not succeed. Uh, the orbs, Mr. Langdon, Mr. Stanhope, Mrs. Uh, Bosco, and Lord Falmouth, Oriental Jones, and some others were of the party, but Lord Bristol was the only sp spouter. The rest, Mrs. Mon accepted, were mere audience. As George Wash Washington is commonly termed the father of his country, the writer of the next and final letter, letter of this group of notable women must perforce be the mother of our broad land. Letters written by Martha Washington are much scarcer than those of her husband. The present example is a typical one and possesses the additional interest of having been in, indicted in the critical days of 1776. The disastrous battle of Long Island occurred just one week after the date of the letter. A dated Philadelphia, August 20th, 1776. My dear sister, I am still uh, in this town and no prospect at present of my leaving it. The general is at New York. He is very well and wrote to me yesterday and informed me that Lord Dunmore, uh, with part of his fleet, was come uh, to General Howe uh, at Staten Island, and that other division of Hessians is expected before they, they think the regulars will begin their attack on us. Some here begin um, to think there will be no battle after all last week our boats made on, on their attempt on the ships up the, the north river had grap a fire ship with the phoenix 10 minutes but she got clear of her and is come down river to on saturday last our people burnt one of the tenders i thank god we shan't want men the arm the army at new york is very large and numbers of men are still going there is at least time in the city fourth uh there is at this time in the city four thousand uh on their march to the camp and the virginia is daily expected i do 
uh, my dear sister most rigorously wish there was an end to the matter and we might have the pleasure of meeting again my duty to my dear mama mama and uh, tell her that I am very uh, very well I don't hear from you as often as I used to in Cambridge I had the pleasure to hear by Colonel Elliot that you and all friends uh, all friends were well and should be glad to have had a line from you by him I hope Mr. Bassett was got the better of his cough long ago please do present me to him uh, my brother and sisters my dear Fanny and the boy and accept the same yourself I am my dear Nancy your ever affectionate sister Martha Washington and so ends uh, William Harris Arnold's Ventures in Book Collecting uh, that was a long chapter uh, I thoroughly like uh, Mrs. Gaskell's letter uh, and Jane Carlyle's letter the Hamilton letter was a bit uh, was very difficult to read because there's very little punctuation uh, there was a, a fabulous uh, line in there uh, where she says uh, I have uh, wrote him and somebody who's uh, become a preacher Mr. Blair uh, I wrote him to desire he now get a wife for it is more decent for clergyman to make use of his own uh, than his neighbor's goods <laughs> But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, you can you can start at the beginning if you haven't uh, seen any of them, uh, and I'll put the uh, the the playlist down that Amy has done at the Dusty Bookshelf, and I want to thank her for inviting me to do this with her, and I hope you've enjoyed it, uh, BookTube. Thank you. <laughs>